смысле. to have 
your truths, your principles, your doctrines lived out through our lives for your glory and for your praise. I thank you, Lord, for this church body. I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for the years uh, of uh, service, but also the light of this church in the communities around us over the, over the past many, many, many years, since 1837. And Lord, may we have uh, many, many more years, at least until you come, where we will have an effective uh, a ministry and a light to our community for Christ. Lord, give us hearts to receive your word today. Give us open hearts and minds to accept it, but also to, to know how to uh, apply it to our lives. And we thank you, Father, that, that, uh, that you hear our prayers because we need to come before you with those who have um, some urgent needs and some um, uh, just ongoing needs, Lord, but you are faithful and you are, you are sufficient in all these. Lord, we want to lift up uh, Chip and Chris Sprague, their daughter Lori, uh, who's, who has been vaccinated already and has already had COVID in the past, has COVID again, and she is very, very sick because uh, so, so many hospitals, Lord, are, are struggling with having enough uh, people in the hospitals, uh, nurses and doctors. Um, they, uh, she can't even go to the hospital right now, and uh, she can hardly breathe, and she's struggling. Lord, we lift up her before you right now and ask for your comfort, your peace. Lord, your healing upon her. For Lee, who is going to be, who is uh, soon heading back home, he'll be traveling in the, uh, over the next several days, and we do pray, Lord, for him and for his safe return. We want to lift up Joanne Bleacher, who just recently had cataract surgery, and we pray, Lord, healing for her. We want to lift up uh, Bill Cluster and his family. We want to lift up his dad, uh, Bill Sr., and just ask, Lord, for your uh, daily encouragement and strength for him, help him to, as he battles his cancer. We want to lift up uh, Esther Sampson before you, and we pray, Lord, that uh, by your grace that there will be another year where uh, there will be after-school uh, uh, Bible studies for those uh, children who would... Uh, who would like to participate in that, that the gospel of Christ would go forth. We want to lift up our missionaries, Lord. We just thank you for their uh, continued uh, faithfulness. And we want to remember uh, the McCloys before you, especially, especially Richard McCloy, who has been uh, struggling uh, with cancer and also uh, a leaky heart valve. We just ask for your help there. We want to lift up an uh, unspoken request before you this morning, Lord. You know the need. We just ask the Lord for your help there. And we pray, Lord, for all our schools and for our students. And uh, Lord, that this would be a good year of learning and growing. And uh, we just pray for your help and guidance in all these things. We ask, Lord, for the power of your presence today in our service. And uh, as we leave from here from, uh, from our service today, that we know that we have been in your presence. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we glorify your holy and precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. So Cliff, Cliff I'm going to ask you to come on up and uh, share the, the special that the Lord has laid upon your heart. Welcome, good to have you. Thank you very much, glad to be here with you this morning. And uh, this is my sister Carla. And some of you probably know her. And uh, so this is kind of a family reunion because my sister Porsche is here and my sister Carla is here. And so Carla's playing for me this morning. She's a broken hand, so give her a break, okay? <laughs> I won't tell you how she broke it. It was kind of a gory story. But... Anyway, uh, these, these are challenging times we live in. Would you say amen right there? Yes. Very confusing yes. times. You can't get the truth anywhere. It's hard to find the truth anywhere. And so we have to really kind of back up and say, well, who's watching out for me anyway? That's what this song talks about. My Heavenly Father. Amen. He watches over me. Amen. <clears throat>
on mountain bleak or on the stormy sea. For come what may, from day to day, my heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in God, I know He cares for me, on mountain bleak or on the stormy sea. my soul, my heavenly Father watches over me. The valley may be dark, the shadows deep, but oh, the shepherd guards his lonely sheep. And through the gloom, he'll guide me home. My heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in God. I know he cares for me. On mountain bleak or on the stormy sea, though billows roll, he keeps my soul. My heavenly Father watches over.
seated. I'll take your bulletins. We'll go over some announcements coming up this week. Today is the last day for uh, given to Jared and Houghton, um, partnered up there. Um, so there is uh, envelopes in the pew if you want to help that situation out. Um, the 30th, this week, our weekly Bible study here at the church, 10.45 a.m. <clears throat> Coming up events, October's getting kind of filled, so circle these on your calendars, please. October the 1st and 2nd, uh, Women's Retreat at Longview. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. October 5th, guys, we have a deacons meeting at Daryl's at 7 p.m. Missionary Committee meeting on the 7th here at the church at 7 p.m. Trustees, October the 9th here at the church meeting at 9 a.m. Please circle your calendar here, our annual business meeting, October the 12th at 7 p.m. <clears throat> October the 16th at Central Church uh, Choices Annual Banquet. Uh, Reverend Jason McGuire will be speaking, and that, like I said, is at Central Baptist, and that is at 5 p.m. Take note here, another uh, Longview event, Lumberjack Teen Rally, that's on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the 16th at 9 to 5. Um, is the brochure out there in the foyer, Pastor, and possibly a sign-up sheet, too? Uh, or we're not sure yet? We don't have the sign-up okay. sheet, but uh, is the brochure out there, Elena? Oh, there you go. Not yet, okay. Not yet. We'll, we'll, we'll put it out there, not a problem. Teen Rally on the 16th at Longview. Happy birthday to Kimberly tomorrow. Uh, Howard on the 28th, or for the 29th. Uh, Herb Herman on October 1st, and one of our missionaries, Jean Carroll, on the 2nd. Wish them a happy birthday. And as I usually say, you guys are absolutely incredible with the giving you do here at the church. Um, with Above and Beyond for Debbie, that was phenomenal. Hope you all enjoyed Debbie last week. I definitely did. Um, and also, last notice here, if you love to sing or play an instrument, we'll be holding auditions. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Please see uh, Dean Beth or Pastor if you want to help us out in this area. We'd love to hear you. Uh, any other announcements that I might have missed or messed up? I don't see any hands. Pastor, are you sure there's nothing? You good? Okay. Guys, you can come forward for our ties and offers, please.
take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 10 and work down, hopefully, if there's enough time, to the end of the chapter. Cliff, I just want to say this. I thought I had a commanding voice. I don't have to hold a candle to do that. <laughs> that was wonderful. Praise the Lord. Well, on this passage, I like to deal with shorter uh, passages, and this is uh, you know, almost the whole chapter, so I hope to do it justice. I've been uh, poring over this over the last uh, month and finally get to the point of being able to preach it. And uh, so there are many uh, principles that I want to bring out from this passage today. Over the last several months, I was made aware of several people I know who became very unill and uh, went over went uh, to the doctors and, and was checked. And uh, two of these individuals had the same type of diagnosis, which made them very unwell. Severe dehydration. Severe dehydration. In light of today's message, Are You Thirsty? I have a question. If our bodies can become uh, unwell due to severe dehydration, physical dehydration, can our bodies also become unwell spiritually from dehydration of spiritual thirst? We need to thirst for God. That is the calling. That is the, the daily need for every single one of us as believers in Jesus Christ. To thirst for the living God. As we go into this passage today, I want to begin with what I see in this passage as the, the primary theme, the primary topic, the, the pinnacle, if you will, of this passage. Jesus says many things in here, but it all concludes with what we see in verses 37 through 39. And this is where Jesus makes a declaration, and he makes that declaration on the last day, the great day. You see that in verse 37. What is that talking about? That is to take us back to remember what is going on in that, this passage, and what is going on is the, is the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. And this is going on for about a week by this Point, and they're at the very pinnacle, the very, the most important day, which is the last day of this Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why it says in verse 37, on the last day, the great day. I want to share with you, I want to give you a picture of what is going on at this moment, on the last day, the great day, before Jesus says what he says. On that day, one of the priests would take a pitcher and he would walk down the temple down this steep hill and he would go to the pool of Siloam. And once he got there at the pool of Siloam, he would dip his pitcher into the pool to draw water out of that pool. And that is a picture of when Israel was in the wilderness and they were so thirsty. It was a, it's a desert area. And that's where Moses struck the rock, rock, remember? And water flowed out from that rock. And this was a remembrance, a picture, with that priest getting the water from the pool of Siloam. And as he dipped the water in there, in that pool of Siloam, the Jewish people would cry out, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. After that point, the priest would begin to walk from that pool back up the hill to the temple. And once he arrived at the temple, he would begin to pour the water out on the brazen altar. And during that time that the water was being poured out on the brazen altar, the priest would walk around that altar seven times. Seven times. And at, while they were walking around that altar, they would cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You get the picture. 
This is on the last day, the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was at that point as the water was being poured out and the, and the priests finished what they were saying about blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that Jesus stood up and he cried out to all the Jews that were there that day. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the scribe, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Can you imagine? I want you to put yourself in that place that day. I want you to be one of those people that saw Jesus stand up and heard him crying out at this great moment at the, at the peak of the Feast of Tabernacles. If anyone thirsts, come to me. That is an invitation. In today's passage, uh, today's passage exposes several issues that we have to deal with on a regular basis that creates in us at times a crisis of faith. Evidenced by fear. We all fear for one time or another. Some, some fear more than others. But it's a crisis of faith regarding fear. But we'll also talk about intellectual pride. We'll talk about hypocrisy. We'll talk about assumptions and uncertainties. And so now as we get into this passage that points to what Jesus was speaking about, about coming to him, that invitation... I want you to look now at verses 10 through 13. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, this is Jesus' uh, half-brothers. We've talked about that before. I'm not going to spend any time there. Then he also went up. And he went up uh, not publicly. So he went up in secret. But not, uh, he went up in secret. He went up privately. Verse 11. The Jews were looking for him at the feast. They were saying, where is he? They expected him to be there. He needed to be there because he was Jew. He was a, he was a Jewish man. It was one of the, the three major feasts that people would come from all over to be there. And they're asking, where is he? And there was much muttering. They were whispering. And we're going to find out why they were whispering about him. They didn't speak openly. They didn't ask a lot of questions. They were muttering. They were actually whispering to one another among the people, among those who would kind of agree with them. And that, those are things that we do. If there's something going on in our culture, and there is a lot today, if there's something going on in our culture, and we could get uh, lambasted, if you will, for speaking openly about it, what do we do? We whisper to those who would agree with us. But they were whispering to one another, the people. Uh, some said, he is a good man. They saw him as a good man. They didn't, that was a limited understanding of who Jesus is, but they saw him as a good man. Others said, no, he is leading people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly. I'm speaking in particular of the, of the religious leaders. There would be consequences to speak openly about what you feel about Jesus, what you think about Jesus. That's going to bring us to our first point. Have you ever struggled with fear? Have you ever struggled to speak openly about Jesus? That's a fear. But what we will find is that those who thirst for God will receive from God the help to overcome every fear. The issue here is fear. Fear is a natural component of the fallen nature. I was wondering to myself, did Ad, would Adam have had fear before the fall? I don't know. I don't know. I, the conditions were so different back then. I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have. I think it is a. I think it is a. A, a natural outcome of our fallenness and a fallen world in which we live. And so many things can happen to us that can create deep fear. 
Sometimes uh, we fear things that we that are not real but could be, you know, the what ifs. And a lot of times we have fear and anxiety just thinking about that. What might happen? What could happen? We don't want that kind of fear. We don't need that kind of fear. That kind of fear says, I'm not trusting in the Lord. But fear is real. We struggle with it. We feel it will, uh, whenever we, we do something that's outside of our comfort zone. We feel it when our safety is in question. That's, that's natural. And when we feel uh, we have to muster up the courage to even speak openly and freely about Jesus without reprisal, without rejection. Oftentimes it's because we, we feel that we might be rejected, that we might uh, offend somebody if we talk openly about Jesus. But these, these fears are real. How do we deal with them? I want you to hear the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah who said this, You are my servant. Do you feel that way when you go to the Lord? Do you know that you are God's servant? I hope so. I hope so. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. And then he says, fear not. In other words, we're not to fear. We're not to be afraid. That goes counter to our trust and reliance upon the Lord. Fear not. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? I like that. Who can be against us if God is for us? And he is. And then Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Jesus was not afraid to speak openly. The people here were. They didn't, have, they didn't feel that freedom. I'm very thankful we live in a, in a land, in a country, where freedom of speech, at least it used to be, uh, something that we were very thankful for, but it seems more and more people are afraid to speak up. But Jesus was not afraid. Look down at verses 25 to 26. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? Focus on that. Whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and say nothing to him. He came in private, but we're going to see in the next text, that in the next passage, that he is uh, going up to the temple and he's going to start teaching. Jesus was not afraid to speak openly about anything to anyone, even the religious leaders. When he said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Why was Jesus not afraid? Because of his complete reliance upon his heavenly Father. And we can do the same Amen. as well. The application of this first point. Those who thirst for God will find the confidence to trust God in times of fear. I want you to turn with me just very briefly to the book of Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Where does our confidence come? Our confidence comes from our trust in the Lord. Verse 8, he is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. In other words, when, a, when, when dry weather comes, when, a, when, when famine comes. For its leaves remain green, and it's not anxious in the year of drought. 
for it does not cease to bear fruit. I want you to understand that picture because that will help us with our fear. This is the tree, and you see it in Psalm 1 2. A tree that's planted near a stream of water and its roots go down toward the water. It doesn't matter if times of dryness comes. It doesn't matter if there's a drought. Those roots are deep. And the tree does not worry at all. And that's exactly how we ought to be. That our roots grow deeply into the Word of God. That our trust is so completely in God, no matter what we face in life, that can instill fear within us. We do not worry. We do not become anxious. If we do, we will go to the Lord and we'll ask for help. We'll find from the Scriptures help to help us in those times of need when we fear. We don't need to be afraid. We will rely upon the Lord. We will trust in Him. Now look at me. Look at uh, uh, the Scripture in verse, verses 14 through 18. We come to our second point. And it says here about the middle of the feast. And this is about three or four days into the Feast of the Tabernacles. Jesus has probably been there about four or five days. Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. So now he's no longer in private. He's openly teaching. The Jews therefore marveled saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? And I'm going to stop right there for a second. Why did they think this man had not had no learning? They had heard him speak so many times before. They were amazed at, at his learning, his understanding. If you remember when Jesus was 12 and was there at the temple, and he was, he was actually teaching, and the priests of that day were amazed at, at, at his level of knowledge. Where did Jesus get this knowledge from? That's what we're going to find here. You see, the, what they were thinking, what the crowd was thinking, how does he have this learning? They were thinking, this man came from Galilee. And let alone Galilee, he came, Galilee, he came from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? They thought he was an idiot. That's how they felt about those people in Galilee. They were not well educated. You need to come under the rabbis. You needed to come under uh, the temple teaching. And he wasn't there all the time. He comes from Galilee. How does he have this level of learning? Look at what Jesus says. So Jesus answers them, My teaching is not mine. That is very important for us as Christians to understand. My teaching is not mine but His who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, let me just ask you right here, is your will to do His will? Then you need to get your instruction from Him. That's how you understand His will for your life. If anyone's will is to do God's will, He will know, not question, not guess, not wonder, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Jesus uh, speaking of himself. In essence, what he is saying is that I'm not speaking by my own authority. There is a greater authority that I am using here, and you need to listen. Verse 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. What we're talking about is teaching. What we're talking about is education. And Jesus is saying flat out, the one who seeks, the one, uh, but the one who seeks the glory, I'm sorry, verse 18, but the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him, who's the him here? It's, it's the heavenly father. The glory of the Heavenly Father who sent Him. Who's the Him? That's Jesus. The one who sent Him is true. God is true. Where do we go for truth? We go to the Heavenly Father. And in Him there is no falsehood. In this second point, I have a question for you. Have you ever struggled with distinguishing truth from falsehood? I know I have. 
you start to wonder, where do we go for truth? Everyone has a differing opinion. How do we understand it? We live in a day where, where objective truth, universal truth, is quickly vanishing and everybody holds to what they believe to be true, subjective truth. Where do we go for truth? Well, how, how do we know the difference between truth and falsehood? I will tell you that those who thirst for God will receive from God an education founded on truth. The issue here is Jesus' lack of education and authority. Education is essential. I talked about that the last time I began to preach the beginning of this. Education is essential. We understand that. It can be also very, a very effective in creating within us a thirst for more understanding. Because there are two types. We see in this passage two types of education. One comes from self-glory. And, and we go to people to learn and we can learn very good things. We can learn things that we need. That's why we need uh, schools. That's why we need universities and colleges and all that. And I talked about this last time we preached. Do we ever stop learning? If, if I'm in my 90s, do we ever stop learning? No, we must always learn. We must always strive to know more and more. But what is our learning for? Is it for our own glory? Or is it for His glory? And that is where all education should take us. To know Him. To know Him. Education, human education, that's, that's taught by humans, it's very good, it grounds us in many things, but it's limited by its very nature because we are finite. We have to go to the one who is eternal who was there at the beginning when he created everything. All education is limited unless we go to him to understand all the particulars that we learn in light of his power and grace and presence in our lives. Those who thirst for God learn to comprehend the particulars in life of God's universal truths. I want to leave you with two, I'm going to continue on, but I want to give you two things. I want you to write it down. The first is dealing with the first point. I want you to write down what type of fear grips you the most on a regular basis. And what I'd like you to do is search the scriptures. You can go to the concordance and go through Check out everything that where it talks about fear. And I want you, if you know what, what fear you're struggling with, look to see what the what the scripture says about it and how God and how God can give you victory over it. And now this next point, I want you to think about education. What in your education, what in all your learning has brought you closer to God? There's your homework assignment. Now we come to verses 19 through 24. 19 through 24. Here, Jesus continues on his discussion in response to what they said. How does this man have any learning? Verse 19 says he takes it in a different direction here. Has not Moses given you the law? Okay, so he's, he's saying something to the Jewish leaders, to the, the crowd that, that they would understand. Has not Moses given you a law? Yes, of course he's given us the law. And then he says this to them, yet none of you keep the law. <laughs> has God given you the word of God? Yes, God has given us the word of God. Praise God. Are you following the word of God? That's the question. Why are you not following it? So he says, has Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. And then he adds on to it, why do you seek 
to kill me. He challenges them. He puts, he puts this discussion back into their lap. Why do you seek to kill me? I want you to look at the very next verse there. The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? You know, whenever we disagree with somebody, what do we do? We begin to tear them down. We don't try to argue the point from a logical perspective. We just tear them down. And that's what we see all the time. And that's what they're doing here. They're tearing down Jesus. You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? I want you to look back at verse 25 and 26 again. Some of the people of, of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? <laughs> they knew. People knew, and so did the religious leaders, that they were trying to kill Jesus. Isn't that a violation of one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill. That's the Sixth Commandment. They hadn't done it yet. They were planning it. It was in their heart to kill Jesus. And Jesus just brings it right up. Why do you seek to kill me? But look what Jesus does. He takes it into a direction that they can understand their hypocrisy. Because that's really what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with human hypocrisy. And, and that's why he brings up the law. Verse 21, Jesus answered them, I did one work. He's talking about a miracle here. And you all marvel at it. It's interesting here. They marveled at the miracle, but they didn't marvel at the one who brought the miracle, did they? Verse 22, Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it is from Moses. Very important to understand, but from the fathers. In other words, God had brought... The, 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 the doctrine of circumcision for the Jewish people, not for everyone, but for the Jewish people. And you will find that in Leviticus chapter 12. I'm not sure if I have it here. Let me, let me just look. I think I do. Leviticus chapter 12. I want you to look at verses 1 through 3 because it's important for us to understand what the law says. But, but before I get there, I just want to say, you know, um, you have received the law, and uh, oops. you have received the law, finding my place again, and uh, Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. In other words, uh, the fathers began to add more legalities to God's law, and actually complicated, which we will see, but... It, here is where the, the law is given in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his, the, the male child's foreskin, shall be circumcised. Okay, what's important to take here, we'll go back to our text, what's important to understand here is that that circumcision for the male child had to happen on the eighth day. Understand? And it's going to happen for some of those parents that after the child is born, the eighth day falls on what? The Sabbath. What do the priests do? They don't say, it's the Sabbath, we can't do it. They say, this is a law. If they have to be, the child has to be circumcised on the eighth day, it's the Sabbath, we've got to do it. We've got to do it. It's interesting, what will happen oftentimes is that one law might collide with another law. But we're going to learn what to do in this situation. And so look at verse 23. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? 
They wanted to condemn him. The religious leaders wanted to condemn Jesus because he did a good thing to a man. He healed him. That was the miracle. A man that needed, needed complete healing. And Jesus made him whole. It just happened to happen on the Sabbath. And so they're accusing him of breaking the law. When the religious leaders do the same themselves. That's called hypocrisy. And this is where we get the lesson from. That Jesus says, do not judge by appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Have you ever judged anybody wrongly? And you realize later on, oops, what did you do with that? Did you get it right? Those who thirst for God will receive from God the means to rightly judge. The issue is man's hypocrisy, God's law, and uh, with, in, in regard to God's law, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Judge not that you not be judged. Right? You remember that? Judge not that you not be judged. But here, in this very passage, he says, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees here is that they're breaking the law, but they have to keep the law. And that's, that's often the problem, is that sometimes laws collide, so what do we do? The New Testament, uh, New Testament understanding of this is found in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 23. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 23. Now we know that whatever law, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, speaking to the Jews, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's the importance of the law here, by the way is to reveal the knowledge of our own sinfulness. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. How is the law in our lives made righteous through faith? in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to stop right there for a second. There is a quote that I came across that made by Bishop Hanley uh, Moulet. And it says this, The harlot, the liar, the murderer are short of righteousness. But so are you. So are you. So am I. Perhaps they stand at the bottom of a mine and you on the crest of an elk. But you are as little able to touch the stars as they. Every single one of us are put on equal footing. We have all sin against a holy and righteous God. We have fallen short of his glory. Look at verse 24. And are justified by his grace. This is where we learn how to judge rightly. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation that is a substitute that is standing in the gap. That is uh, where Jesus has covered our sins through his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance. He had passed over the former sins. Aren't you glad that God has passed over our former sins? But we are still in our sins if our faith is not in Christ. 
Christ. Verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? We can't boast. We have no reason to boast. It is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, by the law of faith. We can't boast in our goodness. And so we realize that we must trust fully and completely in, in what Christ has done for us. We accept that by faith and faith alone because of God's grace towards us. Verse 28, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? No, he's not. He, is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles. And so he's the God of all, whether Jew or Gentile. Verse 30, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do when then overthrow the law? Uh, do we then overthrow the law by his faith? By no means. God forbid, if you will. On the contrary, we uphold the law. You see, it is our faith in Christ that recognizes that the law is good. We, we will break it. We will break it, but the law is good. We can't keep the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, the law is upheld as good, and we recognize that. To rightly judge requires God's perspective. Proverbs 28, 5 says, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand justice completely. What is the difference between human justice and God's justice? Human justice, for the most part, needs to try to keep the letter of the law as much as possible. Sometimes they will exercise grace, for which I'm glad, but God's law looks upon the heart and exercises both mercy and grace through the law. And it is by faith that we are justified. So going back to Jesus' statement, do not judge by appearances. That's typically how we judge. We see things and we, we judge people automatically. But do we know their heart? Do we know the circumstances behind that? No, because we're limited. That is why, if we are to learn how to judge rightly, we always need to follow God's example, which is to use mercy and grace in order to rightly judge. Many years ago, I was pastoring a church, and my wife and I, we didn't live near the church at all. We're, the church was about 30 miles from our house, so I had to travel there every day. And I wasn't, you know... I was familiar with the area, but there are some areas that, you know, I just rarely would go through. Well, at this time, there was something new that was coming into play, and that is they were putting by school zones a camera, okay? And because they didn't have the flashing lights, now we have the flashing lights. Very nice. It gets your attention. You can see it. This had a little red flag by it. Now, I usually did not take this route, but there was something going on, and over a period of many weeks, I would drive this direction. Didn't think anything about it. And I want you to know, you can't even see the school. It's all woods, and there's a little road that goes beyond these woods, and the school's behind it. And uh, so there's science school zone and all that kind of stuff. So I would slow down, but the, the real speed was 20 miles an hour. So, about three, four weeks later, I got something in the mail. A traffic infraction for $120. Said, what? What is this? And then a couple days later, I got something else in the mail. Traffic infraction. You said, what? <laughs> Another couple days later, a third traffic infraction. Big sinner. <laughs> so I said, I'm a sinner. I, I accept that. I'm saved by grace. So I said, I've got to go to the court. I've got to fight this. So I went to the court, and it was my turn to tell them how stupid I was. And uh, so I get up there, and I said, Judge, you know, I don't live in the area. I pastor in the area, but I don't live in the area. And I, I'm really... Uh, 
I, I didn't realize that uh, that I was going through a school zone. I thought I was slowing down enough. And, uh, and they said, uh, was this announced? He talked to somebody else in the court. He says, uh, the judge says to him, was this announced in the paper? <laughs> yes, sir, it was announced in the paper over the last three months. And he said, uh, okay. He said, uh, was there a grace period for this, for anybody that was learning that this is the school zone? Yes, sir. They, there was grace that was extended for about the same three months. He says, okay. He says, you're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, okay, I understand. I get it. So I plead the mercy of the court. Well, they did. They extended mercy to me. They wiped away the first infraction. I had to pay the half, half of the second infraction. And uh, I had to pay the whole amount for the third infraction. I wish I had asked for grace. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really what Jesus is teaching us, to judge rightly. I'm going to bring us to the last point and then a conclusion. Look at verses 25 to 36. I'm actually, this is talking about the ways of, um, there's, in verses 25 to 31, there's many, many assumptions that are given. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to take the time with that. And then in verses uh, 32 to 36, there's many, many uncertainties. And, uh, and we deal with that in life, don't we? We deal with a lot of uh, assumptions. I make assumptions all the time. And uh, I need to be careful about that. We're uncertain about so many things. And uh, I have a, a scripture verse that, uh, something that Jesus said to Philip one time. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and still you do not know me, Philip? Basically, that's the bottom line here, is that if you were to look through uh, these uh, passages from 25 to 36, the problem came because they really didn't know Jesus. They didn't really know who he was. And if they did, they didn't accept it. Because it didn't fit their perspective. So Jesus says to Philip, Philip, have I been with you so long and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Do you want to know God? Jesus said about him, look at verse 29, I know him. Do you want to know God? Do you really want to know the living God? Then you need to come to Him through Jesus Christ because He knows Him. Those who thirst for God will find their way to God through faith in Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In conclusion, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Have you come to Jesus? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you asked him to show you the Father? He has revealed himself through his person, but also through his word. And I want you to see what it says in the last part of this passage. When they, speaking of the crowd, the religious leaders, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. They're getting it. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? No, he doesn't come from Galilee. They didn't understand. He has, has, uh, has not the scripture said that the Christ must come uh, and the, the, from the offspring of David come from Bethlehem, the village of the, where David was? They were right, but they didn't put all the things together. They were limited in their knowledge why education is so important that, that leads us to God. Verse 43, so there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him 
but no one laid hands on him. And then the officers that, officers that they sent out earlier in this passage that we didn't look at, the officers that they sent out, the religious sent, sent out to say, bring that man to us, to, to the chief priests and the Pharisees. They said to them, why did you not bring him? The officer said, no one has ever spoken like this man. This man that had no education from their perspective. This man that had no learning. And yet he spoke like no one ever else. That he spoke with great authority. Not like the scribes and Pharisees. This, the Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? You see, the problem is when one is deceived, they think everybody else is deceived. They don't get it because they don't believe the way they believe. And that causes a lot of problems. Verse, verse uh, 48. Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? So they used their own authority, their own glory to say, we don't believe in him. Why do you believe in him? We haven't given you permission to believe in him. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. That's the problem. If you don't know the law, if you don't know the word of God, you're accursed. You don't understand. But look what it says in verse 50. Nicodemus, remember him? Nicodemus who had gone to him before. He went to him in the night. That's where Jesus talked to him. He said, you must be born again. And it goes on. And who was one of them? In other words, I'm not sure if that means, and I think I know what it means, but either one of them could mean that he's one of the Pharisees, which he was, but I think it means he was a secret follower of Jesus Christ. He believed that he was the Messiah. And sometimes us as Christians can be secret followers of Jesus Christ. We don't want to talk openly about him because we're fearful to talk openly about him. And then, he, then Nicodemus said something that made a lot of sense in a, in a time when there was no common sense at all. Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, here, they just condemn him. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. What we see in this passage really is a commentary of what is going on in our world today. Who do we trust? Who do we listen to? Where do we go when we struggle with fear? All of these things that we struggle with, what it is, what it is bound to do is, it was in our, in a, in our uh, a men's Bible study today, is that we will face struggles and sufferings in this life, but it is meant for us to go through it. As Cliff said, it provides, we, he, he brings us to a place of suffering, but he brings us through the suffering. Ever wonder if you can know God? If you thirst for God, if you thirst for the living God, you will know him. The question is, are you thirsty? Either you will thirst for God, or you will end up remaining where you are. You won't really grow much as a Christian, even as a Christian. If you don't thirst for God, you'll remain where you are. Hopefully as a Christian, but many are not Christians and they remain as they are. For those who thirst for God will receive from God hearts, that's the last point, hearts overflowing with living waters. That's what Jesus says. That's why we need to go to Jesus. I want you to hear the scriptures that speak about our thirst. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 2. As a deer pants for brooks of water, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, God, the living God. 
Does your soul thirst for God? Psalm 63, 1. O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. How many times are you in that situation as the psalmist? And then he goes on to say, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water, he's saying, I am thirsty for you, O God. We live in a land that is dry and arid spiritually. And that creates a spiritual thirst within us. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, incline your ears, and come to me and hear, says the living God, that your soul may live. And then in Revelation 22, 17, the Spirit and the Bride, speaking of the church, says, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. The decision is before you. I think I know everyone here, but I don't. I can't look at the heart like God can look at the heart. So I'm going to give a challenge to you. To those of you who are unsaved or you're not sure if you're saved or not, come. I'm going to invite you right now to come up here to the altar to confess that you are a sinner before a holy God and ask for God to save your soul. Do you thirst for the living God? Do you want to know that you are saved? Do you want to know Him? I'm calling you. As Jesus said, all who thirst, come to me and drink. Come. This is your opportunity. Come. Trust you have a relationship with the Lord, a personal relationship with the Lord, that your sins are forgiven, and that you know with, with every part of your being that the moment that you leave this life, you will be in the presence of the Lord. Do you know that? Do you know the living God? If not, no. Okay. Now, for the rest of us, to you who are saved, has your Christian life become stagnant? Would you agree with me that our Christian life can become stagnant after a while? We can. We can. Have you stopped growing as a child of God? Then come and drink again to the full. Drink again of the living waters of the indwelling Holy Spirit that is within you. Come and rejuvenate your faith in the living God by a declaration of your love and obedience to the Lord. I'm going to ask, this is not to embarrass you. This is not to draw attention to you. But if you've been struggling in your Christian walk, if you have grown stagnant spiritually, I want you to come. I want you to come. You can stand up here. You can sit down in this front pew. But just come and just for the rest of the service, just sit there and say, Lord, I thirst for you. I need, I need to go back to the way it was when I first knew you as my Lord and Savior. Won't you come? I invite you. You can come and just sit right there and just spend some time with the Lord. Don't be afraid. Don't be prideful. Come. With that, I'm going to invite my granddaughter to come up. And in your bulletins, you'll find in the handout on the back of that, 
insert the words to as the deer. Let us all stand. And even if you didn't come up, whether you need salvation or you need a fresh drink of that living water, spend time with the Lord today and worship Him and deal with Him. He is so loving. He is so full. He is so full of mercy and grace. And you will find um, sufficiency for your soul. Go in the strength of the Lord.